All right. Looks like we've reached 10:15 after the hour here, so I think we'll we'll get this uh, session in play here in the essence of time. Make sure that we can get through all the content uh, that we have here for you. Uh, so welcome everybody online that's uh, joined our first breakout session. Uh, my name is Bill Lester. I'm the territory sales manager for Bear Crop Science in southwestern Ontario, and our session uh, is called Bears Commitment. To Canadian Ag through new crop protection innovation and development and we'll be focused on our product pipeline processes and the people that drive innovation and help develop new, tool, new tools for us uh, to use in the field for our business. Uh, we've got two speakers on tap for this session. Uh, the first one is Kelly Pastor who is our agronomic operations manager for cereals and pulse crops based out of Calgary. Kelly's presentation is actually pre-recorded as he could not be here with us live today, but uh, his presentation will be immediately followed by uh, no stranger to our Eastern Canada business, Adam Pfeffer. Uh, Adam is our corn and soybean row crop uh, market development manager and lives and farms near Sparta, Ontario with his wife and two sons. Uh, so before we get started here with this uh, exciting presentation, uh, I need to highlight that Kelly and Adam's presentations uh, contain forward-looking statements based on our current market assumptions and that Bear assumes no liability for these forward-looking statements. So uh, essentially, we're going to talk about some uh, new and exciting stuff, and we just got to make sure we uh, have that uh, uh, statement there in place. Um, so as we get through the presentation, please enter any questions into the discussion and chat area that you see on your screen, and we'll try to address those questions uh, immediately following uh, both presentations at the end of the session. And uh, now we'll turn it over to our IT folks to uh, play Kelly's presentation for us. Good morning and welcome. My name is Kelly Patzer and I'm an Agronomic Operations Manager of Bear Crop Science. It's my pleasure to be here with you this morning to speak to Bear's commitment to Canadian agriculture and more specifically, new crop protection innovation and development that uh, we're, we're bringing. So in, in a nutshell, it's a long way uh, from an idea to a farmer's field. Um, when we talk about new crop protection product development, um, we generally describe this in five distinct phases. Uh, it takes place over a period of about 10 to 14 years, moving from molecular identification to uh, pre-launch, as you can see here in this chart. Historically, only about one of 100,000 substances reaches the market. So if we start evaluating a thousand, we might be lucky to get one in the market. However, this is changing using new technology and I'll elaborate on this in, in a couple slides. Um, this 10 to 14 year process now takes about four to $500 million. And I'm sure as an audience of, of farmers, you can relate to what we're all experiencing currently with inflation. So these costs are obviously increasing over time as we're all familiar as inflation increases. So um, moving through this cascade, I'm going to start with uh, phase zero, which is a molecular target uh, or class hit identification. This is supported by artificial intelligence, and I'll describe this in a little bit of detail, the current state of the art. So X-ray crystal structure approach or X-ray crystallography has been used now for several decades, actually, to um, do 3D imaging of targets. So this is in fact a target enzyme in a weed. Um, this enzyme is actually HPPD. Uh, so the chemical name would be hydroxyphenylpyruvate deoxygenase. And these enzymes are actually proteins. Proteins are consisting of amino acids and you can actually see the amino acids listed here that uh, constitute this target enzyme. So the X-ray crystallography has existed for some time and we were able to see 3D images in organic chemistry um, modeling. However, what's new is the artificial intelligence. So we are now currently using a computer assisted design or CAD to do modeling where we can actually model the best um, chemical structure to fit this binding site of this enzyme within the weeds. And in doing so, we can move to a very much more efficient uh, means of identifying new targets as potential um, crop protection products, in this case, a herbicide. Another approach for visualizing um, these targets um, in weeds um, is using this 3D molecular structure approach. 
in which case um, this particular example is illustrating the ALS enzyme or acetolactate synthase enzyme. Um, as growers, you'll probably um, relate more commonly to this as the, the group two herbicide mode of action. So this um, particular structure um, was actually published recently by Dr. Todd Gaines, who is a um, postdoctorate fellow. Um, he um, spent a term with the aircraft science and he published this in the journal of biological chemistry very recently. If you look at the, uh, the small box on the left within the enzyme, it's blown up over on the right-hand side. And what you can see is the actual 3D structure, in this case of the ALS binding pocket, at which is targeted by ALS herbicides. In this case, we're looking at a sulfonylurea herbicide. And uh, what is being illustrated more specifically here, if you look at this structure in the red on uh, where the laser is, is circling, laser pointer is circling, you can see that um, this area is actually impeding the uh, herbicide, the sulfonylurea in this case, from fitting well in this binding pocket. This is actually as a result of a target site mutation. And um, consequently, uh, through this modeling, what can be done is um, you can model a change to the herbicide such that it could, if you remove this side branch, for example, it can fit better in this binding pocket and thereby potentially overcome this target uh, target site resistance mechanism. So this would be referred to as bringing a new chemistry class within an existing mode of action, which can also be effective for resistance breaking. So those are two examples of uh, candidate identification. Um, once the candidate is, is identified, we move into proof of concept phase or, or phase one in the cascade. So this is a dramatic simplification of what that cascade looks like. Um, this cascade is used for herbicides, for insecticides, and for fungicides. And literally uh, tens of thousands of compounds per year enter this cascade. And um, the materials that are entering this, it can come as designer compounds, as shown in the last two slides. It can come from the more traditional approach of existing um, chemical libraries of many, many compounds from a number of different sources. Um, and it can come from other indications. As many of you know, um, Bayer also includes a pharmaceutical division. So some of the ph pharmaceutical candidates can also be evaluated as potential crop protection products. And there's sometimes some distinct benefits in looking at those candidates because a lot is already known in terms of their safety, for example. So there's three distinct or uh, major stages for identification of candidates using these cascades. The first is high throughput screening. This is highly automated. It's usually plate-based or, or the fancy term would be in vitro based. And uh, in which case suitable organisms with commercial relevance at a very basic level are screened. And in this regard, there's indication-specific compound optimization that takes place. And if you look over at the left-hand side, there's three examples that are indication-specific. So for, for example, you can evaluate um, insecticides on lepidopteran insect candidates as one example in cells in vitro, or you could look in, in um, petri dishes at fungi or plantlets and screen potential herbicide candidates. And you can also look at individual uh, microplots of, um, of plants with, with single plants in a, in a small, um, small basis in petri dishes. So um, that's the first level. The second level would then be taking those candidates that show promise and looking at them on actual plants or actual organisms. And this would be referred to as in vivo or in living plants. And uh, this is typically taking place in greenhouses. So the work is done where we're evaluating these candidates um, uh, on larger sets of major targets. So in this example that's shown here, looking at a herbicide on wider ranges of weed species that are known to be of, of commercial significance. So this part of the world, for example, weeds that are included in here would be wild oat as a grassy weed, kochia or cleavers, a wild mustard, for example, as dicot species. And these are grown out, grown out in a glasshouse environment and these candidates are screened against them. And then finally, the, the third phase would now be taking those candidates that still look like they have promise 
and uh, evaluating those in a segment type approach, looking at both the crops and the targets at more typical application type parameters to determine whether they are actually usable in a commercial context. And uh, this may also include some outdoor trials. At the same time during this, this last or, or third phase in this cascade, we initiate um, safety tests. So things like mamma mammalian toxicology, um, evaluation on beneficial organisms, so pollinators in this example, environmental fate and persistence. So looking at soil behavior would be another example. And within this phase, you can see in this uh, depiction that this funnel uh, narrows significantly at this point. Many, many compounds drop off at this, at this point. Uh, the attrition rate is actually quite high. So for myself as a biologist and uh, looking for materials of interest through grower, um, it can be quite actually disheartening seeing so many good potential candidates that uh, drop off at this point. But on the other hand, as a consumer, as a parent, as a grandparent, um, and um, also just looking out for the public's interest as a bear employee, it gives me a lot of confidence actually that um, bear standards are so high. We see actually, I, I've experienced a number of examples where um, materials would actually be registrable, but do not meet Bayer's internal standards. So as a result, we lose a number of materials at this phase. So through phase one, we often go from tens of thousands of compounds per year down to only a handful, maybe 10 or 20. From phase um, one, we move to phase two and three. Um, these are sometimes referred to as early development and advanced development, or phase two sometimes as pre-project, and phase three as full project. At phase three, we're into full commercial development. So these trials are used for submission and regulatory purposes. And I'll give you an example here. And um, within our, our audience today, a large number of you have probably e either utilized Infinity as a product, and some of you have maybe even supported some of the research trials that went into development of Infinity. So this is actually an overview of the development timeline for Infinity and the new active ingredient component of Infinity of Parasolfetol. Um, at the time, this was um, uh, a program that took place over five years. Um, so from the year 2000 to 2005, over 800 field trials took place in Western Canada. Um, most of these were on either Bayer research sites or in grower fields. And I, I know a number of you in the audience today will have actually hosted these trials. So thank you so much for contributing to the development of a product like this. So from a timeline perspective, this um, uh, took approximately 35 or 36,000 hours of time. So clearly a very, very large amount of time and effort and resources required to develop uh, the new product, Infinity. Just wanted to mention also, and you as growers uh, and agronomists will, will also relate to this. During this timeline for phase two and three, um, we experience a wide range of environments. And uh, this is the same, of course, for commercial production. So during the infinity development timeline, we saw an extremely wide range of precipitation. So this chart shows the percent of 30 year normal precip uh, across years at the various main sites that the infinity development uh, work was done on. And you can see that we ranged from a low of about 30% of normal precip, in which case, we're talking about losing trials often due to drought, all the way up to 160% of, of normal precip. And we in fact lost trials due to flooding. Uh, as a grower, you can probably relate to this. This is pretty normal. Uh, but um, we're compelled to submit uh, trials for registration purposes. So we actually require data. So clearly this creates challenges for our development timeline. But with those challenges actually also come opportunities. And that uh, those opportunities are in that we want to make sure that these products are evaluated in environments that are typical for growers. We want to know how products will perform in a typical environment. And because of this experience and exposure, um, we have the data to develop the label across the range of environments to give growers confidence in the product's performance. So with that, at the end of phase three, the information that's generated um, is submitted for regulatory purposes for product registration. And we move into phase four, 
But before we do that, I just want to give an example to speak to some of the fruits of our labors in terms of this development pipeline. And most of you are well connected in terms of the agriculture media and um, you know, so new information in, in either print media or digital media relating to agriculture. This in fact um, was um, published here over the last few months. Um, and there were several publications. You, you can go on um, print or social media and look for these, but at Bayer Crop Science Field Technology Showcase back in August, there was some announcements uh, made regarding a new herbicide mode of action. And this is actually Rachel Rama, who is our head of the small molecule research and development for Bayer Crop Science at a field day, um, announcing uh, her new mode of action. So this herbicide is in fact a true new mode of action. It's not a new chemistry uh, within an existing mode of action. And it will be the first new mode of action for post-emergence weed control in 30 years. And as you can see in the slide, this is currently in phase three. So um, it, you will see this um, um, in coming years, hopefully. Um, so stay tuned for that, but it's a very exciting announcement. So thank you for your attention. Thanks for the opportunity to share this with you. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Awesome. Well, Kelly gave us a great overview of the early stages of the uh, crop protection pipeline. And certainly uh, in the market development group, uh, really the goal or the objective that we have in our level of testing is really to fill out that uh, phase four uh, through, the, through the transition um, from early discovery to the growers field. And, and really it's exciting from my perspective to see what's coming through our crop protection pipeline you know, years before uh, we get to test it, even in the market development group. And Kelly gave a nice example of a new novel mode of action that's coming through the pipeline that I've had the opportunity to see a few times. And it's certainly going to be interesting to see how it fits our, uh, our local environment up here. But really from a, a market development standpoint, once the, our field solutions team um, submits a label for registration, that's really when we get heavily involved in you know, our group takes um, those new products uh, from the field solutions group. And, and really our main goal is to figure out how to position them on a grower's fields, um, fine tune uh, their positioning. Um, you know, we've got a great handle on what weeds they, um, what weeds they work on, which ones they don't. Um, some of the crop safety aspects of them from a phytotoxicity standpoint. <clears throat> but really our focus is how to position it in a grower's field, um, you know, what competitive comparisons uh, we would want to have a look at. Um, and really the work that we do uh, starts with our market development reps and small plot replicated trials. Um, and then once we get closer to uh, that commercial launch time frame, we move into uh, what we call the research authorization um, stage. And I'm, I'm sure many of you listening in today have participated uh, in these types of trials with ourselves or, or other companies um, here in Eastern Canada, but this is really, in my opinion, when the rubber hits the road, when we really get to test it um, in that field scale scenario and, um, and really see how it works in the real world, so to speak. You know, in a small plot replicated scenario, uh, those that type of trial design is very good at trying to de depict uh, minor uh, differences between uh, products, but really once we get it to the grower's field, you start to see the, um, the variability in weed populations, soil types, um, and weather conditions. And, and really our goal with the research uh, authorization program is to figure out what is the breaking point? What is the, um, you know, how far can we push a new chemistry? Um, and quite often we learn stuff in this phase four of development uh, around position and um, further insights that really weren't even thought about uh, through the development process. And, and to me, that's uh, part of the most, um, one of the most exciting uh, attributes of, of running the research authorization type trials. And this last slide here is just gives us a couple examples of some RAs uh, that we've ran over the last few years. Um, certainly, uh, Greg introduced this morning, um, or mentioned our new introductions to the corn herbicide portfolio uh, with Lotus and Corvus. Um, two products that our US counterparts have had access to for a number of years, but I think have great, a great fit here uh, in our Eastern Canadian marketplace for sure. Um, so again, uh, the field scale research authorization trials with both of those chemistries, 
And then the bottom right, you'll just see a screenshot of our It Pays to Spray website, um, which highlights some of the Delero Complete development work um, that, uh, that we conducted with our market development agronomists uh, over the last uh, number of years. You know, that product in particular, we had an opportunity to look at for two years in a research authorization scenario um, before we got final commercial approval. <clears throat> so we really got to see how it, um, how it fits um, and certainly its efficacy on uh, diseases like tar spots, gibberella ear rot, and, uh, and northern. So again, in the market development group, um, that's, uh, this is one area that I spend a lot of my time in. Uh, looking at our CP portfolio and pipeline and, and really coming up with combinations of commercial uh, products, um, uh, commercial tank mixes, copacks, um, and that's really what I spend a, a lot of my time focused on. So I'm super excited um, with what we've brought uh, into the marketplace over the last two or three seasons. I think all of the, uh, the products, Delero Complete, uh, Corvus Lotus, Bracero Pro, um, they bring a lot of value. They fit a lot of our, our current needs. And I'm super excited uh, for what's coming uh, in our pipeline in the next uh, few seasons here. So I think that will uh, conclude um, what we had from a formal presentation standpoint. I know Bill's going to jump on and, um, and we can certainly address any questions that, uh, that anybody has uh, for sure. Excellent. Uh, well, thanks, Adam. We do have uh, one question that's been uh, entered into the chat here. Um, I guess just to give us some insight on what we're maybe up to for this coming season in 2023. What's our testing plans for this season within your market development group uh, for Eastern Canada? If you can maybe share some insights on what we're up to. Yeah, great question, Bill. Um, so this year, uh, we're still finalizing plans, but certainly continuing uh, to fine tune from a small plot replicated trial standpoint, our Corvus and, uh, and Lotus combinations. Um, you know, we are looking hard at Lotus uh, combined with uh, an old chemistry uh, partner, uh, Group 6 uh, Vermoxinol to give us um, the Group 27, Group 6 enhanced efficacy, uh, so to speak, similar to what we have with our Infinity type products. So that'll be one big focus for us in that post-emerge um, space. And I think, um, you know, partner uh, with anything herbicide related, what is old is new again. Um, you know, we do see enhanced efficacy on weeds like water hemp flea bane um, that Lotus is already very strong on today, but uh, we always want to look for um, multiple effective modes of action. And that'll be one uh, that we're going to focus on here uh, from a post merge standpoint. From a pre merge standpoint, um, we do have uh, a new group 12 that's been talked about. Uh, through the marketing uh, publications as well, um, which really has a focus in that water hemp management uh, front. The U.S. Uh, has been looking at it for a number of years as well. So continuing to uh, get closer to a commercial launch of that product, um, but it'll certainly be focused in that uh, water hemp space. And I think it's going to deliver a lot of value um, in our corn and soybean space uh, here in Eastern Canada. Really, you know, with water hemp, we're, we're well into it. Um, but I think having new options at our disposal in the next couple of years is going to go a long way in helping us combat that weed challenge uh, long term. So, and the other thing that we have that we're looking hard at is a uh, group 15, um, which is uh, and has been a gap in our portfolio uh, for a number of years. But that is one product uh, in both corn and soybeans that we will be looking at on a larger footprint this year, too. So, again, I mentioned, um, you know, the products we've launched the last couple of years. I'm I'm very excited about those products, but I'm even more excited about what we have coming uh, in the next three or four seasons. So stay tuned. Excellent. Yeah, certainly uh, it sure has been fun launching some new products over the last couple of years. And it's always exciting to, to know that there's more stuff coming in the pipeline. So it's going to be some fun times ahead for us in the near future. Um, I guess to, to kind of close off this session, uh, everybody will see a QR code on the screen there. So if you're interested in collecting any CEUs, there's 0.5 units of CEUs available in crop um, management for this session. Um, and I guess uh, we'd just like to thank everybody for attending. I got one last item that uh, I'd like to share with everybody. We're, we are going to have a winner for a pair of heated gloves. And uh, the winner uh, for this session for a pair of heated gloves is Jake Elgersma. So congratulations, Jake, on uh, winning a pair of nice heated gloves. Thanks, everybody, for attending. 
and uh, we'll give you a couple minutes now to shuffle over to the next breakout session. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everyone.